That's a mass choir right there. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. We live after Easter in a lot of ways, right? We live after Easter because historically speaking, Jesus died and rose again 40 days later. He ascended into heaven. 50 days later, he sent the Holy Spirit. We live after that fact. Hundreds of people in the days of Jesus saw him alive. Thomas touched him. The Emmaus disciples walked with him. His other, the rest of the disciples, they all ate together. Later that night when the Emmaus disciples came back, Jesus showed up. They saw him alive. They're, they're all asleep now, but we have their, their eyewitness, their scriptural testimony. We, we live after Easter in another way. We've experienced our own Easter at our, at our baptisms. We, we died with Christ and we were raised with Christ and now we live with Christ. We are in Christ and Christ is in us by the power of our baptism. We live after Easter. We also live before an Easter. Right? Because what are we longing for? What are we waiting for the final resurrection? When those who, are, who sleep in the Lord will be raised, when we who live in the Lord will be lifted up to be with the Lord in the air, we live longing for another Easter. We live between Easter's in a way. Before, after he rose, after we were raised in baptism, and when we will finally be raised. And, and Romans 8 helps us to live in the middle. That's really, I, I think, in a lot of ways what Paul is helping us to do as we, we get into Romans 8. He's helping us to live between Easter's. And today, what he want, we're going to get into this, but he want, what he wants to help us do is to think carefully about what Easter means, what, what happened and what's going to happen so that we can live at peace and joy and with hope, with longing, expectation in the middle. We're, today, we're at Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 18. You can follow along in the sermon notes. Uh, the words of the text will also be on the screen. This is what Paul says to us. I consider, he's thinking about it, that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom and glory of the children of God. We, all of us, we know. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is not, no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people, for you, in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he, Christ, might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. This is the word of our God. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we long for the coming of your Son. We look to the clouds and say, Today, Lord, we long for his coming. We long for the redemption of our bodies. We long for his coming. And so, Lord Jesus, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts may awaken faith in us, a deeper and more fervent, deeper yearning for your coming. Lord God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There, there is a special kind of suffering that Christians endure. Of course, you all know that there is a, a, a suffering that, that all people endure, and, and I won't spend much time get, digging into that, but, but all people, all people suffer pain and loss and death. 
All, all people suffer the pain and the heartache and the weed pulling and the thorns and the thistles that God promised after Adam and Eve fell into sin. And that's something that's common to all humankind. And, and so is the struggle with sin, right? Where it, all people struggle with, with addiction and abuse. All people suffer with poverty. Just walk into any sort of hospital and you will see Christian next to Christian. You won't even know which is which unless they tell you if you walk into any hospital. Talk to a person in a mental health facility. Talk to a person struggling with abuse or addiction and you'll see that Christian and non-Christian all suffer the same kinds of things. It's the way the world is. Ever since the fall into sin, we all suffer because of sin. Sin that happens to us and sin that we struggle with on a daily basis. But there is a suffering that is unique to Christians. And it's this, it's this struggle, I think you'll understand it as soon as I say it, it's this struggle that Christians say, it's not supposed to be like this. See, whenever anybody comes to a funeral, we, we're all sad. Right? Christian and non-Christian, we come to a funeral and we're sad. We grieve because we lost someone. But Christians come to a funeral and we say, this was never supposed to happen. This is the wages that sin pays out. Death is not the way things are supposed to be. Christians realize that. And so when Christians see the curse of sin at a funeral, when Christians see the curse of the sin in their own lives, we feel and we say this groaning and yearning Paul's talking about, it's not supposed to be like this. That's general. But I think we also all feel this in a more personal way. We start to say to ourselves, I'm not supposed to be this way either. And we could identify that in any, in any number of ways. Maybe it's the yearnings, the sinful yearnings and desires of our, of our nature. We have these sexual urges. We have these, these addictive tendencies that are living inside of us. And we feel that yearning. It wants to jump out of us like, like I don't even know what it's like. But it, we feel that and we say, I'm not supposed to be like this. I'm not supposed to want this. I'm not supposed to feel this way. We think thoughts. I don't know if you've ever happened to you, but you think something, you're like, whoa, where'd that come from? Because I'm a child of God, and I'm not supposed to think that, let alone say it. Things fly out of our mouths. We do things, and we look back, and we say, I'm not supposed to be like this. See, see there is this frustration, this groaning, this pain that is very unique to Christians who say, the world is not supposed to be like this, and I'm not supposed to be like this either. If you can even begin to appreciate that tension that Christians feel, that you feel, then you can begin to get your mind to where Paul is in Romans chapter 7. And I know we're in Romans chapter 8. But if you want to understand Romans 8, you have to understand Romans 7 and actually Romans 6. You've you got to reach back into Romans and understand that back in chapter 6, Paul starts at the baptismal font. That's where he starts in Romans 6. And he, and he reminds us there in Romans chapter 6 that we were baptized into Christ. And something incredible happened there at our baptism. Christ was put into us and we were put into Christ. We're, we're living in this new world. We're living with Christ in us and us in Christ. And, and we live and we crucify the desires of our sinful nature. And we're resurrected with Christ to live a new life. That's Romans 6. And then in Romans 7, Paul says, Ah! I know I'm in Christ now, and I know Christ is in me, but, but I have these thoughts, I have these desires that are not good. I do the things that I don't want to do. Ah, who will save me from this body of death? That's what he says. So follow the flow of thought. I'm in Christ, Christ is in me. I struggle, I have this frustration that's common, to, that's unique to Christians. Now what? Romans 8. And what Paul has been doing for us in Romans chapter 8, he's saying, okay, this is all true. There's this tension between the who you are in Christ and this sinful body that you still live in. How do we live in that? And there's four things that Paul's been saying to us. We're going to get to four next week. First, he says, understand this, that the struggle doesn't mean that you're outside of Christ. Remember how he started? There is, Romans 8, 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? There is no condemnation. 
You still struggle with sin. You still struggle in this world. But that doesn't mean that you're separated from Christ. That doesn't mean that God's taken his, his, that God is judging you or condemning you. There is no condemnation for you in Christ. That's part one. Then, then part says you have the Spirit of God and you, you have the Spirit that cries out, Abba, Father. You have this co-inheritance with Christ, so now we have an obligation to wage war. We have an obligation not to live according to the sinful nature that lives in us, but according to the Spirit who lives in us. And then in chapter part three, that's where we are today, Paul begins this crescendo of thought. Right? If we had more time, we'd just walk through the whole thing because it, like, it, it just grows. I hope you can sense that next week when we get to the, the pinnacle of Romans 8. Right? But what Paul is doing in Romans chapter 8, the section that we're looking at today, is addressing the, the pain that we feel, where we, this, the truth that we're not condemned in Christ, and the reality that we still struggle with sin. How do we live in that tension? And what he does for us today is he helps us to think about it. And he, I say that because he uses a couple of words in Romans after chapter 8 that are really mental activities. First, he starts by saying, I consider that our present suffering, that's verse 18. And really, he's saying, we're doing a little bit of a math problem. We're going to weigh this against this. We're doing a reckoning. We're doing a reconciliation. We're doing a, a bank statement. We're comparing suffering to glory that's coming. And then he says, we know, twice he says, we know this. We're going to look at one of them today. And that's the mental knowing. It, it, there, there are two kinds of knowing in Greek. There's the, the knowing that comes by experience, and then there's the knowing that comes from information. Right? That's the knowing Paul's talking about. He's, he wants us to think about it. He wants us to think carefully about what the Scriptures say because what we experience, this is the unique pain of suffering that Christians have, what we know by experience is not what we know by faith. What we know by, by, by feeling it is not what we know because the Scriptures say it, we hear it and know it with our minds. And so what Paul does for us today is he helps us with two comparisons. He helps us with, first, he invites us to make a comparison. Here's the first villain. To make a comparison between current suffering and future glory. This is what he says, verse 18. I consider, I think about, I weigh this, I do the math problem. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Now, that's quite a saying, wouldn't you say? Because present sufferings are sometimes pretty heavy. I, I, when I think about this, I, I think of our sister Dorothea, who's now in glory. Her entire life struggling with spina bifida, the last month of her life living with debilitating leukemia, there was not one moment of her life that was pain-free. I, I would say her suffering was pretty intense. Her whole life. And, and I'm thinking about our brother Steve, who broke his leg again. Same leg, just a little bit further down, right? Just the, the, I don't know what the pain is like, but I can imagine what the pain is like. And you, and you can think about the pain that, that people in your life, maybe that you are feeling, and, it, and the pain is heavy and intense. And if it's not physical pain, it's spiritual pain that we all, that we all have that. These urges and desires and thoughts and tendencies that we know we shouldn't have, but we still have them anyway. The things that we want that we shouldn't want. This, this internal battle between the new me and Christ and the old me and from Adam. Right? To, for Paul to say, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us is quite a thing because our pain is deep and long and hard. But consider for a moment just the duration, the length of time for which we suffer. If, if you make the comparison that way, then even if we suffer like Dorothea did her ent our entire lifetime, and let's just say our lifetime is 110 years, 
Let's say we suffer debilitating chronic pain and struggle with sin our entire lifetime. That length of time won't even register compared to the eternity of relief and glory that will be ours in heaven. Because you can't even put a yardstick to it. I could, I could pull out a string and I could stretch it all the way to the back of church and say that this one sixteenth, one thirty-second of an inch is like that. But I don't even think that registers. Right? So simply by comparing the length of time. Let's talk about intensity though. Because our pain is, your pain is intense at times. Your, your sorrow is deep. Your struggle is hard. Right? It drives you to your knees and you cry out, Lord, where are you right now? But compare the, the intensity of your suffering at its peak to the intensity of God's glory that will be yours forever. It's that vision that Isaiah had. Isaiah 6, <laughs> the intensity of that vision of God's glory, just a glimpse of it, by the way, for just a moment, by the way, and it drove him to his knees. And remember in Revelation, when John sees a glimpse of glory, a vision of glory, what does he do? <laughs> Again, he's to his knees. Because the intensity of God's glory, that's his, he's not afraid, but he's in awe and wonder. He's, he's with the 24 elders throwing his crown before the throne of God and, and all of heaven singing like we did just a minute ago. Because that's how great God's glory will be and is ours for eternity. So, so when you set the temporary heavy weight of our suffering now next to the eternal even heavier weight of God's glory that we will experience, not just know with our minds, but experience with our being, body and soul. There is no comparison. Paul makes another comparison. He invites us to compare child birth, childbearing to childbirth. Now let me read it to you. This is where, where I get this from, verse 20. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Now, I hesitate to kind of go here because one, I'm a man and I've never experienced childbearing, so I can't really know. So ladies, I'm going to ask for your help in a minute. And, and two, I want to acknowledge that for some of you, you never got to the birth. For some of you, the birth was not a joyful day. That's part of what we were talking about before the pain of our sorrow and loss now won't compare to the glory. But I do want to go here because this is where Paul goes. So ladies, I need your help. Give me a, you just shout out a word. First trimester, we'll go through all three of them. First trimester, what was it like? What did you feel? Just shout it out. Sick? Exhaustion? Hunger? What? Anger? You don't know yet. <laughs> right? There's, there's these things that I, I don't know, but I'm just trying to imagine, and I watch my wife go through it. So there's this mixture of emotions when a child is, when you first conceive a child, there's this excitement. There's, there's fear. Sometimes already in the first trimester, there's loss. Right? All of these things are going on inside of us. There's, there's growing. There's hunger. There's excitement. There's all the, there's the sickness. All right, second trimester? Growing? Tired? I think tired's a theme. <laughs> Hungry? You know, there, there's the, the growing, there's the pain, there's the beginnings maybe of contractions or, or Braxton Hick contractions. Third trimester? Overwhelmed, scared? What? You're, you're nesting, preparations, so there's some excitement going on. Birth pains? We don't want to talk about it. <laughs> right? Hurry up and give me the epidural. Right? There's all this, there's this intense, growing intensity of pain that goes along with childbearing. Just, you know, again, that's part of the curse of sin. That's part of what God promised Adam and Eve in the garden. That I will make great your pains in childbearing. The, the pain grows and grows. I can't even describe it because it didn't happen to me. But then the child is born. And what happens almost immediately? 
you forget. And you say, how about another one? Okay, too soon, right? But, but we, why do we have more than one kid? Because we forget about the pain of the other children, of having the other children. Because, okay, here's the fill-in. Can you guys just put it up there? Because I don't remember it off the top of my head. When you get what you're hoping for, that's what it is. When you get what you were hoping for, you forget about the pain along the way. When you get what you were longing for, when you finally hold that child, right? And that's part of the pain of loss before the child is born because you're hoping to hold that child. And you will one day, we pray, right? When, when, you, when you get what you were hoping for, you forget about the pain. And actually knowing what's coming makes you embrace it even more. I will put up with this pain. I will even laugh at this pain because I know what's coming. Isn't that what Jesus did for you? The writer of the Hebrews says this, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. (laughs) That word scorning just makes me chuckle every time I hear it. Because it's like Jesus was laughing at it. The pain of the cross, it's like, come on, Caiaphas, what do you got? Spit on me, hit me some more. Come on, Pilate, come on, centurions, you want to mock me? Okay, fine. Right? Why did Jesus endure all that? Even, he even invited the wrath of God for you. Why did he do it? Why did he embrace the pain? Not because he just hoped for it, because by it he knew that he was winning you. He knew that by his pain and suffering and death and resurrection, he was winning you and covering you with his blood. He knew what was coming, and so he endured even scorn the shame of the cross so that you would be his. And what he started, he will finish. He knows, your Savior Jesus knows your pain in the way that the Father and the Spirit don't. See, your Savior Jesus became like you in every way except for sin. He sympathizes with you, the writer says, in your weakness. Right? He knows your groaning. He knows your frustration. He, he knows your pain. Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted. He didn't do it. He didn't give in. But he knows temptation. And so he is able to help those who are being tempted. And, and not just your Savior Jesus, but his Spirit. Did you catch that in the reading? The Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. He he takes our prayers when we're frustrated and groaning, all of our prayers. He takes our prayers and he perfects them on the way up. He, He brings them before the throne of God and he intercedes at the Father's high throne on our behalf. He he brings our prayers before the Father and makes known to him our will. He makes known to us, he makes known to our Father our heart. And when we don't know what to say, he takes our wordless sighs and he brings them up as a prayer before the Father. Yes, your Father, together with His Son and their Holy Spirit, they will finish what they started in you. They they will carry out the work of salvation that was begun, that was finished at the cross, that was begun in you at your baptism, that was predestined before all eternity. God will carry all of that to completion. Now, the reality is we suffer. We, we, we groan and we struggle and we yearn. We yearn like a mother to hold her child. We, we yearn like a sick person longing to be well. And we know that our hope will not be unrealized because our God will finish what he started. And in this hope we are ha- saved. It is not a hope that we will hold in the here and now. Because if we hold it here and now, then it's not really hope anymore. But what we hope for, we long for, and it will be ours. And so this is where we live, hoping and longing for the day when faith will be sight, when hope will be fulfilled, and all that will be left will be love. 
love for each other and love for our God. This is the life after Easter. Amen? Amen. Now the God of peace grant you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Amen. Amen.